How much is your life worth? What would you be willing to take for your life? How long do you think your life will last? We'll be taking a look at these questions on today's program, so please stay tuned. The Churches of Christ of the North Texas area present The Truth in Love. How precious is the book divine Hello, I'm David Roper, preacher for the Brown Trail Church of Christ, the congregation that oversees this program. Today's speaker is one that's noted for his knowledge of and reliance on the Holy Scriptures. Johnny Ramsey of Rowlett, Texas, spends much of his time holding gospel meetings throughout the nation. He's also the editor of the Christian Bible Teacher, and he speaks twice each Sunday on the radio at 6.45 a.m. and 8.45 p.m. on KRLD, 1080 on the dial. We feel privileged to have him with us today to speak on what is your life. The book of James is the most practical book in the 27 New Testament books on Christian living. It and Philippians are perhaps the favorite book of most Bible students. In James 4.14, the question is asked in a haunting way, what is your life? The answer, it is only a vapor that appeareth for a little while, then vanisheth away. In Psalm 90, verse 12, we read, So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And Christ must be Lord of all, or He'll not be Lord at all. The clock of life is wound but once, and no one has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. Now is the only time you own. Live, love, toil with a will, Place no faith in the morrow, for the clock may then be still. One of the best ways to decide what our life is, is where our emphasis can be found. Paul said, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we look for the Savior, who shall fashion our vile body like unto His glorious body. You'll find that in the beautiful and rich book of Philippians, a four-chapter book written to Christians telling them how to live and what their life was really composed of. In fact, the book of Philippians has a good four-point outline. Philippians 1, 21, Christ is the purpose of life. Chapter 2, verse 5, Christ is the pattern of my life, have the mind of Christ in you. Chapter 3, verse 14 of Philippians tells us Christ is the prize of our life. I press on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. 
And then Philippians 4.13 tells us Christ is the power of life. I can do all things through Christ who empowers me or who gives me strength. Another great book telling us the purpose of life is the book of Luke. In Luke 2.49, Jesus said, I must be about my Father's business. You can outline the 24 chapter book of Luke around that verse. We should be about our Heavenly Father's business too. Jesus said in John 6, 38, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him that sent me. And just before He went back to the Father, He prayed in the beautiful prayer of John 17, verse 4, I've glorified Thee upon the earth. I've finished the work which Thou gavest me to do. It truly is a wonderful thing when we consider that our life is a blessing from God and we're to use it to His glory. In Isaiah 43, 7, God said, I made man for my glory. But in Daniel chapter 5, sadly, a wicked man named Belshazzar was told by Daniel, God's statesman, God's great prophet, the God who made you, him you have not glorified. You've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. In uh, 1 Chronicles 16, 29, we read that we're to worship God in the beauty of holiness and give God the glory that, it, that is due His name. In 2 Chronicles 26, 5, we learn, as long as Isaiah sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. I don't know of a book in all the Bible that tells us of men seeking the Lord more diligently, more fully than the book of Acts, the book of New Testament Christianity in action. One man writing a commentary on the book of Acts concluded with this statement, perhaps if we believe now what those people believed then, we might accomplish now what they accomplished then. Let us notice just a few of the beautiful statements in the thrilling saga of the book of Acts. The purpose of those people's life was to glorify God. They went everywhere preaching the Word, Acts 8 verse 4. They even went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them, and there was great joy in that city. And when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. In Acts 4, the apostles were told not to speak at all nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But immediately upon their release from prison, they were standing in the temple teaching the people. The Jewish leaders called them in and said, We told you not to preach the resurrection of Christ anymore. Peter said, But God told us to preach it, and we ought to obey God rather than men. They were beaten for glorifying God in the proclamation of the Word. But the next verse says, Daily in the temple and from house to house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Truly their sound went out into all the earth, Romans 10, 18. All creation under heaven heard the gospel preached, Colossians 1, 23 tells us. Yes, the whole world was told the glad message of redemption, sweet song. They began in Jerusalem, went into Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth, preaching Christ. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith, Acts 6, verse 7 tells us. The word of God grew and multiplied. They so spake boldly that a great multitude believed. Mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. They glorified God in the proclamation of His Word. They glorified God also in holding up His Son. In Romans 3, 24 we read, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. On the very next page, Romans 4, 25 tells us, He was delivered for our offenses, raised again for our justification. No wonder they glorified God in preaching His Son. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. And by the grace of God, He tasted of death for every man. Christ was the one who died for all. So the love of Christ constrains us, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. The joy of Christianity, answering what is your life in the proclamation of the Word of God, Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord. It truly is a wonderful thing as we encompass the book of Acts and Romans and Hebrews and James and Philippians, in fact, all the 27 New Testament books, to see the purpose of life. Friend, have you ever noticed the simplicity of the outline of the New Testament? The books are divided into four parts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first part, tell us the life of Christ. Then the book of Acts tells us how to become a Christian. And then Romans through Jude and 21 epistles tell us how to live the Christian life. And finally, the book of Revelation tells us the hope of a Christian, in hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised before the world began, the sterling message of Paul to Titus in Titus 1 verse 2. The poet has said, 
out of this life I'm unable to take. Things of silver and gold that I make, all that I cherish and all that I keep, I must leave behind when I fall asleep. And I often wonder what I shall own in that other world where I go alone. What shall they hear and what shall they see in the soul that answers the call for me? Will the great judge come in when my task is through, my spirit for gaining some riches too? Or at the last shall it be mine to find all that I've worked for I've left behind? Jesus said, Lay not up yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Solomon understood what life was all about, but sadly for him it was too late. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, in a book uh, where we have Solomon's last will and testament, some have called it Solomon's soliloquy, he says in essence, whatever I desired, I acquired. Whatever I wanted, I purchased. But when I came to the end of my life, I said, vanity and vexation of spirit, a striving after the wind, there's no profit under the sun. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, every secret thing, whether it be good or bad. I read an autobiography of the world's wealthiest man several years ago. It was ghostwritten by Jim Gibbons of the United Press, and it really was an interesting book. It told of the life of the richest man in the last three or four hundred years, by far the richest man. And here's what he said. He said, I was married five times. I had five children, one by each of my wives. At this time, none of those ten people will even speak to me. He said, a wealthy man is a miserable man. He said, you can just paint the town red so many times. You can just go to so many dances and just get drunk so many times, and then you come home, a miserable man all alone, the loneliest man in the world. In the bootleg barren days of Al Capone, he made a million dollars a month over several years, but he had 18 bodyguards that guarded and watched him around the clock. He had no peace at all. He couldn't enjoy the simple pleasures of life though he made a million dollars a month. A simple New Testament Christian who may have been a milkman in Chicago in those days making $20 a month had more peace of mind, more of the blessings of this life than Mr. Capone did. What is your life, my friend? Where do you put your emphasis? Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Where I preach regularly, I ask brethren to read the Scripture text of the lesson or the kind of lesson that will follow. Several years ago I preached on the sin of materialism, and that's the worst problem we have. It's worse than humanism, existentialism, hedonism, and all those other isms, because materialism is a respectable sin that filters even into the lives of folk who claim to, uh, who profess to believe in Christ and follow His will. The best text in the New Testament on a sermon for materialism is 1 Timothy 6. I asked Brother Jackson, who was the best reader in that congregation, to read 1 Timothy 6, beginning with verse 6. I didn't realize he had gotten new bifocals the day before, but when he got up and started tilting his Bible in different directions trying to read it, I knew we were in trouble. That verse says, Godliness with contentment is great gain, but here's the way he read it. Godliness with contentment is great pain. And I've often thought a lot of people look at it that way. Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, it is certain we'll carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. For those who would be rich fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish hurts and lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some having coveted after have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Put them in mind not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Several years ago on the front page of the Dallas Morning News, James A. Metcalf had a beautiful poem. How many days are there to live? How many nights to sleep? How many are the memories that I may always keep? What notice will I get from God when He decides to call? What warning of that final breath, if any sign at all? The more I think about it now, the more it seems to me that life is but a stepping stone to God's eternity. And only as I strive to live according to His will is any prayer I ever say that He may yet fulfill. How many moments yet remain for labor and for love? I wish they were as countless as the silver stars above. Truly, what is your life? How are you spending it? 
The reason this is an urgent, important question, a necessary one, that propounds itself in our hearing from day to day is the uncertainty and brevity of life. You remember Job's wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? He said, naked came I into the world, naked shall I return, blessed be the name of the Lord. And then he spoke of a place where the wicked cease from troubling and where the weary be at rest. But the major theme of the book of Job is the brevity and uncertainty of life and how we need to spend it and use it to the glory of God. And uh, there are a lot of people who have never learned that lesson to glorify God in their life. Here's what Job said about the brevity and uncertainty of life. My days flee away. The man that's born of woman is a few days in much trouble. No man is sure of life. My life is swifter than a weaver's shuttle and is spent without hope. Here's what the psalmist said about our life that is like a vapor that appeareth for a little while then vanisheth away. The psalmist said our life is but a tale that is told. That's a verse Shakespeare stole from the Bible, incidentally. In Psalm 89, 47, remember how short my time is. But the most graphic is the 144th Psalm, verse 4. Man is like a breath. His days are but a passing shadow. No wonder the psalmist exclaimed, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The book of Proverbs says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day shall bring forth. Isaac spoke for us all when he said, I know not the day of my death. Since none of us knows, we ought to remember that Jesus said, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. But we cannot die in the Lord unless we live in the Lord. And Paul wrote these two verses in 1 Corinthians 7, Serve the Lord without distraction, for the fashion of this world passeth away. In 1 Samuel 20, verse 3, we read, there's but a step between me and death. Several years ago in a beautiful little train station in southern Wisconsin, during a snowstorm, I stepped into that uh, depot and I noticed on the wall some religious literature. One was a little piece of paper about that long, that wide. It had a picture of a man crossing the street in either Chicago or New York, one metropolitan city when the traffic was very busy. And underneath the picture it said, is he stepping across the street or is he stepping into eternity? And we do not know the answer to that. This may be our last day, my last sermon, the last one you'll ever hear. What is your life? Are you using it to glorify God? Second Samuel 14, 14 says, We must all needs die. And ours is water spilt upon the ground that can never be gathered again. Since it's appointed a man wants to die, and after this cometh judgment, Hebrews 9, 27, we should use this brief span of life, of time called life, to the glory of God, to the enrichment of our very souls, to the betterment of society. Philippians 2, 15 says to Christians that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of truth. Will you live too long or die too soon? A preacher friend of mine had that as a sermon title, and that's about half a sermon in itself. Will you live too long or die too soon? Demas lived too long. He had once been faithful to the Lord, and he wound up because he loved pleasure more than God in departing from the work of the Lord. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. 2 Timothy 4.10. And 1 John 2 says, If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Demas should have died when it could be said of him, he's a faithful laborer in the gospel of Christ, but he lived too long. He lived long enough to turn back to the beggarly elements of the world, to quote Galatians 4 and 2 Peter 2. After having known the way of righteousness, he went back to the pollutions from whence he had been delivered. Felix didn't live long enough. He died too soon. Felix heard the gospel preached, and he trembled at the truth. Paul reasoned with him of righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, and Felix trembled. That's the power of the gospel. God's dynamite, Romans 1, 16. But he didn't obey the truth. He said, Some more convenient season I'll call on thee. Acts 24, verse 25. But he never received that convenient season. The Bible nor history records such a change in his conduct. He died too soon. How will it be with you and with me? In Luke chapter 10, we read of a very common example of how people misspend their lives, not by being atrociously wicked, overtly sinful, but by choosing less than the best. That would be common with a lot of people who fail to put their approval on things that are excellent. Philippians 1.10. The last paragraph of Luke 10 tells us of two women 
friends of our Lord, the sisters of Lazarus whom Jesus raised from the dead. One of them said, Lord, rebuke Mary that she come and help me with my serving. This woman was doing what was ordinary and common. She was taking care of the meals and hospitality. But Mary was seated at the feet of Jesus, listening to the words of eternal life. Instead, Jesus rebuked Martha, 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 you're careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary had chosen that good part, and it shall not be taken from her. You see, the most important, indelible thing in life is to prepare for the life to come by learning the principles of righteousness, of conduct that is becoming of a child of God. So many people squander their life, not in overt wickedness, but by less than the best they're capable of. Like the one talent man in Matthew 25. He didn't rob a bank. He didn't murder anybody. He just didn't do what he was capable of doing to the glory of God. And the Lord said, You're a wicked and slothful servant. Get out of my kingdom. James 4, 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him it's sin. We need to understand that great salient truth. In Luke chapter 12, though, we read of another man who misspent his life. He did what a lot of folk do today. Millions do. He tore down his barns and built greater barns because he had better crops. Jesus said, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. He spake a parable unto him, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he said, What will I do? Where can I bestow my goods and my fruits? And he said, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build greater barns, and there I'll bestow my goods and my fruits. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, take thine ease. Eat, drink, be merry. Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. But God said, Thou fool, tonight shall thy soul be required of thee. And then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, this man coveted his own goods. He circled his life around one concept. Wealth, more wealth, more wealth, more and more and more. He was never satisfied. In Luke 16, we have a third dimension in this book on what is your life. Beginning with verse 19 of Luke 16, we have the interesting story, some call a parable, concerning the rich man and Lazarus, another man named Lazarus. This rich man, like Solomon, fared sumptuously every day, was attired in royal garments. He had the pomp and pageantry surrounding him that most of the wealthy people always have. Believing like Epicurus that man is wholly, totally mortal, therefore eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, this man pursued that course of life diligently. There was a beggar outside his gate just wanting the crumbs, the scraps from the rich man's table, but he ignored him. Though the prophets of the Old Testament rebuked man's inhumanity to man and man's social sins of ingratitude toward God and a failure to be brotherly toward his neighbor, you remember the story how that the rich man died and woke up in torment. And uh, this poor beggar was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom when he passed on. And now in the story our Lord taught, the tables are turned. And the rich man wants uh, Lazarus just to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool his parched tongue. But this man now begs for someone to come back to his brethren who are still alive, lest they come to this terrible place. Now he is awakening to valuable principles and the right emphasis in life. You remember how... Father Abraham, representing God, said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you had great things and Lazarus nothing. Now he is comforted and you're tormented. We need to understand that our life is to be used as a workshop, if you please, to the glory of God, that we might prepare for an eternity of praising God over on the other side. The poet said, When life's journey shall have ended and we stand before the throne, when the book of life is open and the deeds of man made known, and the Lord shall meet the world and shall judge the lives of all. When all men are rightly parted and the reaper's cry shall call. When the righteous are rewarded and the wicked know their end. Will the world at last remember that a Savior died for men. We need to make our will the Heavenly Father's will. What is your life? What are you here for? To glorify God. To honor His Son. To obey His Word. To prepare for eternity. And with this hope within our hearts. Our lives will be richer and more nobler. We need to understand that God can use us to His glory if we will submit to Him. It's interesting to me that the verse that follows the question of our study, the idea of what is your life, says, You ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll do thus and so. Friend, if you have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, rendered humble obedience to His commands, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. 
And we ask in the language of Acts 22, 16, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In Philippians 2 we read that Christians are not to murmur and complain. A friend of mine has a sermon entitled, Are You Humbly Grateful or Grumbly Hateful? For this life God has given us, let us be humbly grateful. Let us stand up for Jesus. Let us do His will. And may those who see us from day to day know that we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Truly, what is your life? It is an opportunity in which we glorify God. Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wanderer, Lord, and tempest tossed. No storm can hide that radiance peaceful beaming, since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, This has been The Truth in Love, sponsored by the Churches of Christ of the North Texas area. For a copy of today's program, additional information, or Bible correspondence course at no charge to you, please write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. Once again, write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. We invite you to attend the Church of Christ in your area. Join us again next Sunday at the same time for The Truth in Love.